about this, I want to encourage you. There's never any reason, never any reason that you should be sitting alone. And what I mean is, y'all love each other well. Sit beside each other. Get to know each other. You know what? I miss it. Now, I know we don't, we're hipper now. But you know, back in the day, we used to call everybody brother and sister. I didn't even know their names till I was like 28. <laughs> it was brother this, sister that. And I want to encourage you to remember, the fact is, we may not be calling each other that, but we are that. We are brothers and sisters. And we have each other's back. We're guarding each other, loving each other. You know what? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you 15 seconds to stand up and go sit somebody, by somebody right now because that's your brother and your sister. On your market set, go. Now, this isn't your chance to make a move on that person. <laughs> Come on. You doing it? <laughs> no, you cannot stand by me while I'm preaching. <laughs> What time is it? What time is it? Oh, what a move of the Spirit on Sunday. Aren't you thankful? A little bit of a different approach, I know, on, on Wednesday night. By the way, next Wednesday night, I encourage you all to be here. We're having our um, annual church business meeting. First time we've ever done it on a Wednesday night. Um, but we need you to be here. We need a quorum of people. And we're going to have some worship again and, uh, and vision and, and, and rehearsing what God has done. And then the week after, we'll get back to our normally scheduled Wednesday night uh, gathering. What time is it? How many of you still wear an old-fashioned watch? I had an eye watch for a little bit, and it just bugged me because I, have, I just like my normal watches. And uh, you can right now look down, and based on the position of the hands on your watch that, the, 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 you know, that are pointing to numbers, you're able to tell the time, right? So what time is it? Somebody just look down and tell me what time it is. At 6.55? Okay, you can tell. See, you only need to be able to read the signs to tell the times. Right? You only need to be able to say how many, like my watch right here, maybe some of you couldn't read it because it doesn't say one, two, three, four. It's just got a little line. <laughs> and I have to every once in a while say, what one is that? But you have to be able to read the signs to be able to tell the times. But oftentimes in our own weariness, our drowsiness, and even sometimes our neglectfulness, we can find ourselves confused concerning the signs of the times. How many of you, let's just say, everybody over 50, and, and, and if you're over 50, and when you were a kid, people were talking about the coming of Jesus, raise your hand. And maybe there's been a tendency in your life to say, you know, well, my goodness, it's been 50 years now. Where is he? What's going on? But I'd like to be able to just to point out this. In the past 50 years, how many of you would agree we're at least closer and not further away? Amen. Jesus is coming back. And so what can happen after, even in my lifetime, I'm, I'm 45 now, and um, in my childhood, I remember people preaching and talking about that, that Jesus was coming back. I remember one, it was probably a Sunday night, we had Sunday night church service, and, and I remember playing out in the playground. We had a playground out there that's parking now. And I remember being out there, and it was one of those weird nights where there was a red like haze and red and we were all I remember as kids were like Jesus is coming back look at the sky we start freaking out we start crying you know the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord and it was all red out we were like it's happening are you ready and you know we were all like no Lord not yet you know for me I wanted to I wanted to have a locker I wanted to get married and I wanted to have sex before Jesus came Check, 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 all done now. Come on, Jesus, bring it. <laughs> and uh, how many of you got kids who are like, not yet, Lord, I'd like to do this and this. The only thing, the only thing I'm, that left to do, I wouldn't mind experiencing are grandchildren. And, uh, but even that, I'm okay, Lord, it's, it's all right if you want to come on back. But you even found yourself in seasons of your life saying, I just don't think it's ever going to happen. 
you know, doubting that it's even going to happen. Recently, because the, you know, how you have to, you know, follow the signs to read the time. Recently, one of my sons, Levi, he came home from school and he was really tired and he went right upstairs and he went to bed to take a nap. And it was one of those real heavy, deep naps. And at about 10 o'clock, it was in the winter, so it was dark. He woke up at 10 o'clock and walks downstairs and starts to put his clothes on and, and eat breakfast. And he's thinking it's the morning and he's just taking a nap and he's thinking it's, it's time for school. He was disoriented and didn't realize what time it was. Come on. Any of you perpetually late, they'll be here at 7. <laughs> Always unaware of what time it is or, or how long it actually takes them to get ready. Right? And, and I want to just say to you concerning this issue and spiritually what is happening right now, we cannot afford to mess up on the timing of this. These are the end of days and you don't want to be unaware or late to what is about to take place in this world. What the Holy Ghost is trying to do by showing up on a Sunday like he did this past Sunday is not just so we leave and say, wasn't that precious? He He's working to awaken and alert us and to get the message out that it is time. The Bible said in these last days, he pour out his spirit in an increased measure. So it's another sign pointing to the time that Jesus is coming back and you don't want to be left unready. Come on, somebody today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are the end of days. Matthew 24, 36 said, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. You know, even Jesus is waiting for the Father to say, Right now, right now. We won't know the day or the hour specifically. If you hear some prophet out there prophesying, you know, that, oh, it's going to be here and then, count them off. Amen. All right, turn them off. But we can know, according to Scripture, we can know the season. We can identify the times that we are living based upon the signs, right? In Matthew 24, verse 32, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. How many of you walked outside today and thought, Something's happening. Something's shifting. I finally took my reindeer and Santa down. I'm now gearing up for springtime. You can tell it because you just look at the signs. The signs are pointing to the times. And, and the scripture says, so as soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things or all these signs, you know that it is near. And scripture says, actually, right at the door. Right at the door. In other words, it is time. Therefore, keep watch. Keep watch. Because you do not know exactly what day or hour the Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house, and you are the owner of your house. You know that? You know you are the house of God? The temple of the Holy Spirit? It says, but if the owner of the house had known. Because that's what's going to take place is the moments after, the minutes after, somebody's going to say, if only I had known, if only I had been aware, if only I had been alerted. But that's exactly what the Holy Ghost is doing in this time, trying to make you aware and alert you so that you would take watch because you are the owner of the house. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. And the Bible says he's like a thief in the night. And would, not have, and would not have left his house to be broken into, not allowed intruders, things of the world, the enemy, sin, the devil to come into his home. If he would have kept all that out and been ready, it says, so you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And I believe that the purpose of the prophetic... And the scripture is not to scare you, but to warn you, to alarm you. How many of you know every morning, if you wake up on Tuesday mornings and get up super early uh, to, for an early morning Tuesday prayer with you all, I have to set my alarm clock at 4.30. It takes a while. 
And I set that alarm clock, and what I have to have is something to scare me a little bit. I have to have something to jolt me, something to uh, alarm me and awaken me out of lethargy and, de and despondency and into a place of getting up and being ready. Ready for what, guys? Let me just tell you. There's, there's really one or two things that you need to prepare yourself for. Every person on the face of this planet either needs to get ready for the trials that are going to come after the rapture of the church, or you need to be ready to escape those trials through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through the rapture of Jesus Christ. Some of you, how many of you were here before COVID? Before COVID hit, you were part of this church family and you were here and, and, uh, along the way. I want to remind you that the few months before COVID, Charity Church had soared to new heights. I don't know if y'all, do you remember the last Sunday before COVID when everything shut down? That last Sunday, God's presence, we had two services and they were both jam-packed. 650 people were here. And um, we're not up to that attendance yet. We're not. And, uh, and, and, and I remember the Holy Spirit just moving mightily, and, it, and God's presence was thick in the place. But a few months prior, the Holy Spirit had told me and warned me that there was about to be a great shaking and a pruning, and that our attendance was going to go way down. I thought, what in the world is that? You know, what's going to happen? And um, sure enough, uh, COVID happened, and, and the attendance way, went way down. And how many of you recall me preaching and speaking on that? based upon the Holy Ghost. Do you remember? Do you remember that? Okay. Today, I prophetically preach to you and tell you so as to warn you that the days ahead are going to be filled with darkness, but the light within us shall not be snuffed out. Those who will that means those who want it shall be filled with the fire of Holy Ghost and nothing shall cause that great fire to be diminished inside of that person. In fact, the darker the day, the brighter the light will shine. That this time I see something different. This time I see people standing up against the walls because they are so hungry and they aren't blind and can see the signs that the time is up and time is out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be frustrating. Your chairs are going to be closer. It's going to be more difficult to control the air conditioning and make sure everybody's comfortable. It's going to be this and it's going to be that. But is there anybody, you know what's so funny? Is there's people saying, I'm willing to lay down my life for Jesus, but would also say, I ain't going to that church because the chairs are too close to each other now. <laughs> we're making room for souls. That's what we're doing. So I just want to say this, we're living in biblical times. Don't read your Bible and think those are biblical times. I'm telling you, we are living in biblically significant times right now. And the Bible has a lot to say about the end of days and the final generation because it pertains to a lot of people, a lot of his sheep. More people are alive right now on this planet than ever before in history. As a matter of fact, we're just about a couple of months shy of hitting the 8 billion mark. 8 billion people. And speaking of the end of times, Jesus actually said this in Matthew 24. We're talking about 8 billion people. He said, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. That sounds perilous, doesn't it? These are obviously very serious times. We're living in severe times. I'm not here to try to predict the future or anything like that. The only one who knows the future is the one who controls the future. But with all that is going on, I do need to remind you right now, do not be shaken. God is in control. Amen. Never forget that. Come on, someone. And I'm not just talking about what's happening over in Russia. I'm talking about what's happening in your life today. God is in control. You may get a bad diagnosis. God is in control. It may be the avenue in which he wants to take you home. God is in control. Things maybe didn't work out how you thought they would. God is in control. Come on. You should amen that if you need to receive that into your life today. Hallelujah. But here's the deal. It really is a big deal what's happening in Ukraine right now. It's a very big deal. It's prophetically significant. Russia has a leader working, I believe, to reestablish what was the former Soviet Union empire. 
I believe the Ukraine was his first place, his first step towards dominating uh, Europe again. And if you didn't know it, that Ukraine is the first of about 14 other nations that used to make up the Soviet Union. And I believe that he is making an effort to take all of those lands back. The other nations that I believe he plans to invade following Ukraine are NATO nations. That means North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They're in a treaty with us, with the West, and Ukraine was not. And so he started there. These are nations, that, again, that are in alliance with the West, nations that we have vowed to protect militarily. Do you hear me? You don't see us right now putting troops on the ground in Ukraine because we were not in a treaty with them. But by law, if he steps into some of these other nations, we have to put our soldiers, our men, our women, their boots on the ground there. Do you understand? That's significant. It's a big deal. And if you didn't know it, Russia is a, a big player in end time events. Russia's in scripture. Ezekiel 38 through 39 says, speaks of this place called Gog and Magog. You ever heard of it? Magog means prince of Rosh. Gog is, is, is the word Rosh. Rosh is the old root word for the land Russia, for Russia. Gog speaks of the leader of Magog. Magog speaks of Russia. Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 2, which is a prophetic scripture about the end days, says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Gog. Again, I want to make sure you got this again. Gog speaks of the leader of Russia, which right now is Vladimir Putin. And it says, set, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, which, which means Russia, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Listen to this. Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. They were all sons of Japheth, uh, who was one of the three sons of Noah. And Japheth and his family migrated north to the area we know today as Russia. Gog, or God informs Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38, 15. It says, you will come from your place in the far north. And that word literally means the uttermost part of the north. Just doesn't mean north of you. He's speaking of the land of Israel right now. He's speaking specifically of Jerusalem. All right. Jerusalem, there will come a place from the uttermost part of the north. What is north of Jerusalem? If you were to take a look at a globe um, that isn't distorted. You know, when they lay them flat, it distorts things. But when you look of, at a globe and it's round and you look at Jerusalem and you go directly north, directly north of Jerusalem is this place called Moscow. Now, it says you will come from your place in the far north. What's north of Jerusalem? Moscow. What is north of Russia? Nothing. Meshach because remember the word Meshach was in there. Meshach is the old name for the capital of Western Russia, which is today known as Moscow. Now, I'm not digging into end time revelations today, but I'm making sure you know that Russia is specifically named and spoken of when scripture speaks of the end of days. So if the signs are pointing to the times. What do we do now that we know what time it is? What do we do? The urgency of the hour demands. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. Look at the Spirit of God moving on our young people and our children. And I want the Spirit of God to make your old body feel young again. So that you can do the work of the Lord until your very last breath. Listen, what do we do? The urgency of the hour demands that we live our life ready as soldiers in God's army. There's no more time to dawdle. There's no more time to play around and to, and to have fun with the, the sin of this world. In Romans 13, 11, it says, do this, not feel this, not think this. It says, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than we had ever believed. 
The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing, not in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy. And then it says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts and its appetites and its desires. The main reason that God provides prophetic revelation in Scripture is to alarm us into a place of intentional and holy living. Come on. And if ever there was a time, if ever there was a time that you should not be distant from the body, it's the time. If ever there was a time when you should not be drifting away, it's this time right now. If ever there were a time when we needed to be aware of the devil's schemes, I know of people right now drifting and, and they're offended. And you know what? They never say, I'm offended. They always say, I'm being led. I'm being felt. Whatever. Let me tell you, a lot of people use God's name in vain that way. Out of, uh, of, I'm offended, I'm leaving that place, I'm moving on, and calling it God leading you when in fact it was your own immaturity that wouldn't deal with something. We are the family of God. We don't divorce. We stick together. We work through it. We deal with what we got to deal with. Now, I, I'm, I'm coming to you as on behalf of someone who's experienced divorce in my life even. And so when I did miss it and when I did fail, aren't you thankful for the grace of God? And there is times when the Holy Spirit does tell you and the Holy Spirit does lead you. But don't ever use that as an excuse. Come on. Come on. The devil knows that his time is short. And he's going to use every trick, every trick in his book to get you to drift. He will use legitimate and illegitimate concerns to distract and to dissuade you. As a matter of fact, if you look up the term distraction, um, here, let me give you an idea. This is what distraction does to you. The, the, the actual medical term distraction, this is what was distraction back in the day. You ever seen where they would tie, um, it, it, was, it was a way to kill someone and torture them. They would tie each of your limbs, your, your arms and your legs to a horse. And they would whip that horse and distract you. Pull you right apart. Pulled in other directions. There are people right now distracted by the world, by, by pleasure, distract, and it's just going to pull you apart. It's going to pull you away from the word of the Lord, from God. Come on, somebody. And so the enemy's going to try to do that. You know, I don't care. Maybe COVID was a legitimate concern for you, and maybe, you, you know, uh, and, 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 but whatever it was, legitimate or illegitimate, he's going to use it. If it's offenses, grief, idols, and hobbies, and money and anything that will pull your attention and affection away from Christ and his church. It's time that we give our affection and our attention back to the Holy Ghost, back to Jesus, back to the kingdom of God, back to the work of God, back to him. When the soon coming trumpet of God blasts, you don't want to be found missing in action. The urgency of the times that we are living in reminds us to live today, live right now, as if Jesus is coming back tonight, this moment. What time is it? It's time to get out of spiritual bed and slumber. It's time to rise to your calling it's time that you start doing what you were born to do i want to say to you you are not attending a church where the pastor wants you to come up or come sit and watch him operate in his anointing and, and celebrate his giftedness and 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 amen his preaching you're attending a church where the pastor believes you have an anointing and you have an assignment and you have a calling and you have a gift and you are to rise up and operate in it and let it flow you were born on purpose with an assignment you don't need my gift you don't need my anointing you're probably not going to get this pulpit but you got your own stand in that place with the authority and humility of the lord jesus christ hallelujah it's time 
It's time you start reaching out. It's time you stop seeing your job just as a place to get a paycheck, but actually as your mission field. It's time you start laying hands on the sick and heal them. What? Yeah, I mean it. It's time you make prayer not just something you do on Tuesday mornings, but a way of life. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, I rarely pray more than 30 minutes, but I rarely go more than 30 minutes without praying. It's time to open up your home and invite your brothers in and your sisters in. Because there are some people who won't go into a church. They're not comfortable going into the church. But here's the deal. What they don't know is you are the church. And when they walk into your house, they're walking into church. You're the church of Jesus Christ. It's time to begin to tell your neighbors about Jesus. It's time you stop trying to get as close to the world and still make it to heaven. It's time we start trying to get as close to heaven as we can so that we have something of supernatural power to offer to the people here on this earth. Boy, that's true. You, you know, we didn't like being called holy rollers. We didn't like looking like weirdos. We didn't like being radical and loud for Jesus. We didn't like being made fun of. And in our effort to try to be liked by someone, we lost our heavenly purpose and flavor. It's time the church get its supernatural flavor and anointing and our salt, saltiness back in Jesus' name. Ruah. Yes. In short, our job in this moment, in this late hour, is that we would rise up and be a weapon of war in the fingers of our God. Our job is to be an arrow in the quiver of God. You said, well, he hasn't used me yet. He hasn't done what he promised he would do in me yet or through me yet. Listen, you're an arrow in the quiver, and one day it's going to be your turn, and he's going to get you out, and he's going to put you under some pressure, and he's going to aim you at an issue at a devil, at at some demon, and release you. And the anointing is going to come flying out of you. And it's going to pour out everything you've been waiting on. It's coming because now it is time. It's time. It's time. Woo! About to break out in tongues right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time to be sharp. It's time to be lethal. It's time to be fiery hot. We are in the army of the Lord. It is time for the supernatural to increase in your life and in this church so it can increase in the lives of, 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 of the people that your life touch us. I recently heard of some men who had an experience, a, a heavenly encounter or a spiritual encounter, and what happened was that they actually were given a vision of hell. In the spirit, the Lord took them and gave them a vision of hell. And one of the stories was that this guy for six months was tormented by it. And and, and just, I mean, just, uh, you know, imagine having a glimpse of hell and, and feeling that and knowing that there are people burning there. But what happened was from that vision, a fire burned in him to reach the lost. Every time he went to a store, he saw them in hell. Every time he went to work, he saw those people in hell. Every time he talked to somebody in his family, he saw them in hell. And he put, there was something in him. He had a supernatural encounter. It's time that we begin to increase in our supernatural flow. It's time we be a people of the spirit, not of this world, but of the kingdom of heaven. We may be in this world, but we are not of this world. If there's anything that we can do for this world at this time it's that each of us begin to rise up and operate in increased supernatural power the world needs a church that is in tune with God a church that is finely tuned and endued with power from on high that will affect the natural on this earth with the supernatural. Do you agree with me? I said, do you agree with me that it is time once again to be a spirit-filled, supernatural, power-packed, 
woman of God, man of God, grandma of God, daughter of God, son of God, child of God. Well, if you agree with me, I just want to remind you of something again that I said a moment ago. I'm not talking about the church 2700 South Tibbs Avenue. I'm talking about Stephen. I'm talking about Kevin. I'm talking about Johnny. I'm talking about Amanda. I'm talking about Mary. I'm talking about you. You are the church. So it's time that you begin to change your position and rise up in the authority and in the supernatural of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How can I, how can I, how can we increase in our ability to operate in the supernatural? See, I've been, I've had the privilege of being around some people that, that have this flow about their lives. You ever been around just people that they're in tune? They're tuned in and, 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 and you know, mothers and fathers in the faith. And you're like, I want to be like that someday when I, when I grow up, you know. And they have a fire in their lives. And I believe that it all comes down to this. And I mentioned this word to you on Sunday. Some of this I mentioned to you on Sunday. It was just pouring out of me. But if you want to increase in your flow of the supernatural, it will be because of this. Proximity. Proximity. Nearness in space, time, and relationship. The people that I've met that have this incredible flow in the supernatural are people who have positioned themselves continually nearer to God. I'm blown away by the number of people, and it's a trick of the devil. I know that's just how he works, but still, there's sometimes every, every once in a while I look at someone and I think, You're, I, I thought you were mature. I thought you were more grown up than that. And every time something happens, they're gone. They disappear. They fade. They isolate. What are you doing? You're moving your proximity away from the very source of the power that you need to get up, to rise up. Oh, the devil's such a lion jerk. And so the people that I know in my life that over the course of time have earned my respect as, as believers, these are people that, you know what I find? Every time. It's not that they didn't go through tough times. Every time they go through tough times, they just keep getting nearer to God, closer to God. It's not near for a moment, near on Sunday, near during a difficult time, near during a trial. They set up camp close to the Lord. They've decided better is one day in the courts of the Lord than a foul. I'd rather be a doorkeeper having to be outside watching everybody go in and out than be partying out there with the wicked. Yes. All right? Proximity. Nearness in space. Nearness in time. Nearness in relationship. Now, I remind you that at the beginning of all of this, we were meant to walk with God in close proximity like Adam and Eve. Just take a look. That's the way it was supposed to be. I was even, I, I think, I, it was me and my dad on a four-wheeler. A couple, couple days ago, we were driving there and all these, you know, stickers and thorn bushes. I said, Dad, I don't know if you knew this, but did you know the thorn bushes are because of Adam and Eve? In the original garden, there weren't thorn bushes. And when sin happened, it said briars and thorn bushes and stuff like that were a part of the curse. I hate them. Yeah, they're always in my way. So in the beginning, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. In our efforts to get as close to the things of the world, we've grown very far from God. In our efforts to be acceptable and tolerable to the world, because we want to be liked, because we want to be loved, because we want to be cool, we want to be hip, we don't look anything like the Lord anymore. We've tried to see how close to the things of the world we can get and, and still make it to heaven instead of seeing how close to heaven we can get while living on this earth. I think we need to flip the script. See, earth is natural. Heaven is supernatural. It's time we flip that script of what's been common and position our lives close to heaven so that we can serve as a conduit through which his glory and his power and his healing and his miraculous uh, power can pass from there to this earth. Jesus is the one who kept saying, the kingdom has come, the kingdom has come. It's come to earth. It's here, it's here. All you have to do is grasp it, he's saying. He just kept saying, it's at hand. What's that mean? It's within reach. 
It's not some way up there, far-fetched idea that only superstar holy men can be anointed and filled with the Holy Ghost. It's within your reach, within your grasp. You are on this earth to fulfill the assignment of God. The kingdom of heaven is within reach right there, right there. Some of you are increasing in your anointing right now by hearing the word of God. By release, I'm speaking into your soul. I'm speaking the word of God right into your spirit today. And something is bubbling. Something is beginning to rise up inside of you. Mm, mm. It's like holy radiation. Radiation. The closer you get to it, the more it changes the fiber of who you are. Moses operated in the supernatural that caused him to literally glow with the glory of God. Why? Because he had close proximity to the Lord. He met the Lord on the mountain. He met the Lord at a burning bush. He met the Lord wherever he was. And it's time you and I begin to meet God in the morning, meet God in the evening, meet God on the mountain, meet God in the valley, meet your God. And every time you take another step closer, see Moses killed a man. He went running away and he lost something of the glory for that season. But the gracious glory of God said, Moses, I'm still not done with you. Even though you made a a big mistake if you'll come closer and change your proximity I'll give you your glory back I'll give you your glow back I'll give you your radiance back and I believe that that is what is happening in the church of Jesus Christ today he's given us our power back our supernatural authority back so that when we pray things will change so that when we lay hands on our sick they will recover so that when we put our hands on dead and dying people they're gonna get up they're gonna get up they're gonna get up Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proximity, near in time, near in space, near in relationship with God, will intensify the supernatural glow of your life. But it comes with a price. A price that many of us don't want to, aren't willing to pay. We're saved, thank the Lord. Are you saved? Thank Him. But available to us, saved people, beyond mere salvation, is the opportunity to walk nearer to God in such a way that, again, we become those conduits of supernatural power that would change the world around us. The reality is, I don't even have to go into all of the things that you know that you should be doing, you know. We don't change our proximity, and can we just be honest, because we're lazy, we're rebellious, this flesh that we're clothed in doesn't want to get up and pray, doesn't want to get up and spend time. We don't, I don't want to have to talk to people I don't even know. We're selfish. If I'm telling the truth right now, would you just lift your hand and say, yep, that's the truth? Well, everyone who didn't raise your hand, you qualify as the lazy. <laughs> or stubborn, or whatever it is. But remember what Scripture said just a moment ago in these end times, what to do. It said, put on Christ. Cover that laziness in Christ. Cover your rebelliousness. Cover the selfishness. Cover yourself with the surrendered, selfless, willing spirit of Jesus Christ. You know, he was offered the kingdoms of this world. He rejected that offer. He could have taken the easy way out. He could have called down thousands of angels to come and get him from that cross and make him all good. He rejected that offer. I don't know that my flesh would have rejected that offer. How do we position ourselves nearer to God? You know, things like worship, be a worshiper, be a prayer, uh, God's word, obedience to the promptings that he's speaking to you, rejection of sin, constantly feeding the spirit. I I've learned what you feed, you lead, my friends. All right. If you feed the flesh, the flesh will lead you. If you feed the spirit, the, the spirit will lead you. And how do you put away the misdeeds of the body? You live according to the spirit. Right? Come on. Listen, and I want to say to you, it's not perfection he's after, it's proximity. 
It's not perfection. The disciples, you know, they were used for great and powerful works. Why? Because they were so highly educated and amazingly, I mean, they were wealthy, they were rich, good looking. No. Why did God use them for greatness? Their proximity. They said, okay, I'll follow you. Okay, I'll be nearer to you. Okay, I'm done with this world. Okay, I'm leaving everything else behind. You know, we have this new batch of people in our church um, that are hungry and they're growing. But I've noticed that some of the folks who've been around a long time are disengaged, stagnant. <laughs> Alarm! Warning! Do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? I don't care how long you've been in the church. I don't care if you think, well, I've served my time. You're on this earth still. And I'm telling you what, you better be careful because if you don't get to business, it may be that God said, I can't get nothing out of them. Let's go. We're taking them. I want it. you you got to accomplish the purpose and the reason for which you were born and wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Some of you watching even right now, it's time for you to wake up right now. Scripture even warns people that have been around it for a long time to be even more diligent because they have a tendency to fall asleep at the will more than others. Ephesians 5, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk. Look carefully how you walk. That means watch how you're living. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best of the time because the days are evil. Maybe you've been around a long time and maybe you've heard every sermon that could be preached about the end times. You've grown up in this. Listen, you are in danger of being one of those virgins that have neglected the condition of your lamp and your oil, neglected your anointing. The groom is coming at any moment and maybe, uh, and maybe you're not ready. God forbid. I don't want that for you. I'm your shepherd under the hymn, the great shepherd, who's trying to say, come home. Stop kicking, stop resisting, stop. Stop being stubborn, stop being selfish. Me too. Me too. Stop being so comfortable. Maybe that's you too. I'm talking to some people I've grown up with, some people I'm growing old with now. People who are sitting back and letting other people just take the lead. Letting other people just come to church. Let the others come to church, you know, on Wednesday night or whatever. If that's you, you need to respond to the alarm of the times that we are in and come and repent today while there is still time. You've got to seize the opportunity of a lifetime during the lifetime of the opportunity. How many of you wish you would have bought a house two years ago? <laughs> and have sold it now how many of you wish you know come on now today you'll get that opportunity to come and commit yourself back to the Lord Jesus Christ what I'm asking you to do is change change your proximity your personal nearness to God my grandma used to have a sign in her house that said if God seems far away guess who moved God seems far away, he's at the door. It's you who moved. At Charity Church, you can grow as much as you want to here. You sure can. But some of you just haven't wanted to. Some aren't hungry. Some aren't thirsty. But here's a promise from God. In James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. How many of you love the presence of God? Is anybody just in love with the presence of God? Oh, I love to be around Shelly. She's so sweet. She's so precious. She's a good kisser. <laughs> she, she's just, I, she just makes me feel great. But she's not my Jesus. I'm telling you, it's time we draw near to God. He said he will draw near. He promised. He promised. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Let's change our proximity. Let's draw near. Let's position ourselves closer to heaven. I tell you, I've had times where I felt the kiss of God. 
He's an even better kisser. <laughs> you know? Here, listen, here's another promise that is ours for when we change, if we change our proximity to God. It was true in the Old Testament, and it was true for us New Testament believers. In Daniel 11, 32, those who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. You know that scripture? Okay. Another version actually reads it like this. The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. That's a ruah moment right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The word know in that Old Testament comes from the word gnosis. G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Gnosis means knowledge, all right? But the word used here isn't just the word gnosis. It's the word epignosis. E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Epi means higher, more intimate knowledge. We're not talking about, well, I'm an American, so therefore I must be a Christian. I've checked the box. Even that nowadays isn't even popular. Uh, the, the fastest growing group is the non-religious folks in America right now. But it used to be that people, oh, I know about God. I'm, no, no. It's not talking about I know in my mind. Okay, so where is there a, another time in scripture where that same word epignosis, higher knowledge, is used? Well, it's used in Genesis. And it says, and Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. He wasn't like, I know about that woman. He knew that woman. And because he knew that woman, something supernatural took place that you can't even describe, where suddenly the seed became flesh, and there was a baby in somebody's hands. And the Bible says that those who epignosis, no, not know, know their God, will be strong and do great exploits, and they'll hold in their hands the fruit of knowing God and experience the supernatural of walking with him and they will do great exploits how do you know God and make fruit proximity mm -hmm. you ever met someone there's one person at this church they I, I love them with all my heart but they have no sense of personal bubble. <laughs> when they talk to you, they're right here. And I'm always like, <laughs> and they go like this, and I go, hey, I <laughs> proximity. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to know you that well. <laughs> but I want to know him and be strong and do great exploits. Worship team, you can come get ready. I do have about five more minutes. We have opportunity to be more than just saved. We have opportunity to know God and do great exploits supernaturally. Listen, that Daniel eleven thirty two scripture where it says, and you will know God and be strong and do great exploits, uh, that scripture was written to a group of people in scripture called the Maccabees. They were a small band of devoted God followers who attacked and defeated the forces of Antiochus Epiphanes. They did this over and over again. They kept defeating him and conquering him. Antiochus Epiphanes was a God hater. He hated God. He hated God so much that he desecrated the holy temple. This is what he did, the temple of God's presence. He uh, sacrificed a pig, which if you know anything about the Old Testament, was a detestable animal. You were unclean for even touching it. He went in the holy temple and sacrificed a pig to the false god Zeus on the altar in the temple. And the Maccabees took action leading to many victories and their exploits became legendary. I think it's time for the church to be legendary again. I think it's time for you and me to be legendary believers again. That are doing great exploits. See, that principle goes beyond just the prof prophetic fulfillment of, of the Maccabees or whatever. But throughout the Bible, we see mighty exploits done 
by people who are just willing to get, put themselves in close proximity. Hebrews 11.32, in our New Testament, our, our book, our covenant. And what more shall I say? I do not even have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. How many of you think it's time for you to begin to administer justice for somebody out there where injustice is happening to them? Or, or gain a promise who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and rooted foreign armies. That's us. Your name should be in that book of Hebrews chapter 11. My name should be in that book of Hebrews chapter 11. And the word exploit actually has two definitions. I like to bring you the definition. What's that mean to, to be strong and do great exploits? The first definition is this. Make full use of and derive benefit from a resource. We just want to be saved. But our commander wants us to bring his kingdom from heaven to earth. Bring light into darkness, healing into brokenness. That's what he wants. That's what we're called to do. Let us be the generation of those who will seek our God and be strong and do great exploits. The second meaning of that um, exploits means a bold or daring. Such as healing the sick. Praying for people right then and there. You know you've been at a store when the Holy Spirit said, embrace that person, talk to that person, talk, love them. And you didn't do it. And every time you disobey, you remove yourself from proximity. i got to tell you, this is a natural thing, but it's very supernatural. Every time my kids don't do what I tell them to do, they remove themselves from my blessing. And if they do it long enough, they eventually earn my discipline. But all discipline is meant for course correction. Do you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost tonight? I do. I've said it. I've wanted this. I told a group of pastors today on Zoom, I said, we're living in unprecedented biblical times and they agree it's happening not just here God wants us to live in the full strength and power that Jesus made possible through his death he desires for us to become mighty men and women of God to be able to be strong and do great exploits if you're here today and you just feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost and you know you've drifted and you know that you're not, I'm not even saying you're like out sinning. I'm just saying you've just been, eh, eh, isn't pleasing to the Lord. But if you're ready today, I'm still open these altars, just you and the Lord. I'm not even going to lay hands on you. But if that's you, go ahead right now, just come to the altar. You just want to respond. You know what I'm asking? Who here needs to change their proximity, their nearness. Go. I remind you of this. People like Moses who changed their proximity and they experienced God. I remind you that the Bible said even when Moses was doing all that, he said, no man shall see God and live. Well, here's the deal. The closer we get to the awesome glory of God, the more we die. The more we die. The more we die, the more supernatural life of Christ rises up and awakens inside of us. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives within me. I am personally, Paul Slagle, is gearing up, working to change my proximity in relation to the Lord. If that's you right now and you know you've got to grow closer and, and be more surrendered, come and join me at this altar.